Thank you, ladies. A lot of encouragement in that song. Appreciate that. I'm going to dredge up some terrible memories for some of you this morning. Some of you, it may be good memories, like Jason sitting back there probably. Do you remember as a kid when the teacher said, we're going to go outside and play and we'll choose up teams? We're going to play kickball or dodgeball, might have been soccer, baseball. And all of a sudden, you get a pit in your stomach because you know you're probably going to be picked last or close to last. Of course, Jason probably always picked first, so didn't have to worry about that. But, you know, some of us didn't always get picked first. And you think about that, and there's no worse feeling than getting chosen last. And it's kind of miserable. But it's interesting what the Bible says. You know, what does that really mean when it says many are called but few are chosen? In Matthew twenty-two fourteen, 14. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 22 and let's look at that. I mean, does God deliberately want of us, some of us to have a pit in our stomach and to feel bad? Or are some of us not going to get chosen? What does this really mean? I think there's a lot here that we really need to think about as we look at this passage in Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to look at verses 1 through 14. Now, I just want to read through it quickly so you get it in its context and what it's really trying to say here. It says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by a parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to their wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to the merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and they gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So we see in Matthew 22 here, Jesus is talking about a wedding feast. But unlike most weddings, this one involves the king himself. So we know it's a very important wedding. And it's the king's son that is getting married. And as we look at the plot of this story, we have some cold, obnoxious invitees. You have a murderer involved. You have destruction of people involved. You have homeless people. And you have everyday citizens as guests. Now when we look at this story, it it comes on the heels of two other parables. And all three parables are directed towards the Jewish leaders. The scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. But it's also directed at each of us. It comes in the context of the last week of Jesus' life and his death, burial, and resurrection. Probably in the middle of the week, about Wednesday. And, and, And by this time, the chief priests and the leaders of Judaism are really upset with Jesus. He's starting to take their people away. He's really infuriated them with with destroying their way of life 
their ways of making money, their ways of controlling the people. And, and, and we see a whole new setup beginning to happen with Jesus. I'd like you to turn over a page to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? If you kind of picture this in a way, now, Jesus liked to go to the synagogue and he liked to talk. But remember, this is the same Jesus who came into the temple area and he drove the money changers out. So the priests and the leaders of the temple are very upset with him. And now he comes in and he starts preaching to all the people. That would be like having somebody come into our church, walk up to the pulpit on Sabbath morning when you're all sitting there waiting for the service to start, and they just start talking. Probably a couple of you elders would come up or deacons and escort them out <laughs> if somebody did that. They said, wait a minute, who are you, Jesus? What kind of authority do you have to do that kind of thing? And, and then in Jesus' response, let's go to chapter 21 and go to verse 43. And here is how Jesus answers them. Chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So Jesus is telling them, he's saying, look, he's saying, I come from the authority of God and I want you to know that this is all going to be taken away from you. You're not going to have the privilege of sharing God with the world anymore. It's going to be taken away from you, and it's going to be given to those who deserve it. It's going to be given to the Gentiles. I mean, you can see why they were looking to kill Jesus. I mean, he was really, totally against everything they believed. And was destroying their economy and their way of life. And their traditions. But I want to go back to the beginning of this parable now, and I want to understand what's going on here. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And let's take a look at this and see what's going on here. Remember, this is preached just before chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew. Matthew 24 and 25 are the chapters that deal with the signs of the time of the end. And when you look in the Bible at the signs of the time of the end for the Jewish people that were listening and for the disciples and the followers of Christ, they did not distinguish between what would happen in 70 AD, what would happen the end of time, or what would happen the next day. To them, it was all very close. And shouldn't it be for us today, too? When we read these chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, we ought to be thinking, this could happen in my lifetime. Jesus could come in my lifetime. And here's what's going to happen. It, and so when we look at this, the, the whole meaning of this parable is in the contra, context of the, the betrayal of Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and all that he would go through. And what he's doing here is he condemns Israel as a whole. And then he, he looks at individuals also. We sometimes think that the things in the Bible are just for their day and age. But when we look at this story, it's not just for the Jewish leaders back then. It's for all of us to wake up and to listen. What is God trying to tell us here? What is going on here? And, and really the bottom line is... As we look at all of this, the bottom line is, while Jesus is condemning the Jewish leadership, he's also giving them an invitation for eternal life. And that's what he's giving each of us, an invitation for eternal life. And he just wants to wake us up, to remind us that he is coming back very soon, that he has died for us, that he rose again so that we might have eternal life. And it has a reference here, as we look at these verses, it has a reference here to a banquet. King James says dinner, some say banquet, and it's a messianic banquet. And it's mentioned in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 19, if you go there, 
Revelation 19, and we'll look at verses 7 to 9. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. I still love to hear the Bible and the pages turning in the Bible, even though some of you use your phones and iPhones and iPads and everything else, and I still like to hear the pages turn. And so we look at Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So when it's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's talking about God reuniting his church once again with him for all eternity in heaven. It's having a people ready for salvation. Ready for eternal life. And we know it's a very serious imagery here because when you look at the end of this chapter, there's a man who comes in without a wedding garment on. And, and I find that very interesting because we were talking about this in Sabbath school. But look at the way people dress nowadays compared to the way they used to dress, whether it's for church, and I, but even weddings and funerals. People don't dress like they used to. And, uh, and there was a certain way that you were expected to dress, especially if you were going to the king's son's wedding. And apparently this man was not dressed properly, and we'll look at that a little bit later, but it really signifies the rejection of God's grace. And I want to look at these three different points in this story as we look at First of all, in verses 1 to 3, how the invitation is refused. And then I want to look at verses 4 through 8 and how it's not only refused, it's violently opposed. And then when you look at verses 18 or 8 through 13, it, it shows the invitation is given to anyone who would come. So we see the different parts of this story as it unfolds. So let's turn to Matthew 22, and we'll look at verses 1 through 3. And Jesus answered and spake unto them by, again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now, I know some of you just got married not too long ago. And you send out a lot of invitations, don't you? I, I don't know why we send out a lot of invitations. If we want a lot of people to come to the wedding or we just want more gifts sent to us. <laughs> For me, you know, Roberta lined everything up and took care of everything. So I didn't have to worry about anything. If it had been me, uh, we'd have gotten the justice of the peace. But that's probably the way a lot of guys feel. <laughs> But the ladies really want to make a big deal out of it. And they send out as many invitations as they can, not for the gifts, but they want their friends to be there, to celebrate with them, to enjoy that time together. And they're all bubbly and enthusiastic and just ready for the wedding. And as guys, we just kind of go along with it and we're terrified. So. And so we look at this story, and the people are invited to the wedding banquet of the son and as we look at it in the meaning of it, it's the Father inviting the Son of God. It's an invitation to witness the wedding of Jesus to his church. And so here we see the real meaning of this parable. It's really an extended simile as you look at this story. The parable says that a king gives a wedding banquet for his son. And as we know, as I mentioned, it's the story of God the Father uniting his son with the church. It's the end of the world. It's Jesus coming back again and inviting us. And of course, we, as we look in the Bible, there are many references to weddings as the, the king and the Messiah and Jesus coming back. There are many references to the bridegroom and to the bride. And in the Old Testament, we see the same thing. 
I think it's very fascinating because what it's telling us is that God extends the invitation to all of us, wants all of us to come to the wedding. But he's also talking to these Jewish leaders, these ones who reject Jesus, who reject his message and don't want to have anything to do with it. And yet they still get the invitation. It reminds me of Hosea in the Bible. It, to me, sometimes God uses illustrations I don't quite understand. This is one of them. God goes to Hosea the prophet, and sometimes I think, wouldn't it be kind of cool to be a prophet? Be like Daniel, be second in charge of the kingdom, or, or Joseph, or, or like Elijah or Elisha, and bring people back to life again? And I think, well, wait a minute, Daniel was in the lion's den. <laughs> And, uh, and many of the prophets were killed for their faith. And we look at this story, and, and Hosea is a fascinating illustration. Hosea is a prophet of God, and God goes to Hosea, and he says, I want you to marry Gomer. Now, first of all, I don't know if I'd want a wife whose name was Gomer. <laughs> and then he says, and, and, and by the way, she's an active prostitute. And I want you to marry her. And when you marry her, remember, she gets to keep being a prostitute. And she's going to keep practicing as a prostitute. And then she's going to leave you and she's going to go back to doing that full time. But he, the story doesn't end there. God tells Hosea, what I want you to do is I want you to go back and get her again. And bring her out of that life again. God uses some strange illustrations, doesn't he? I don't understand always why God does what he does. But in that illustration and in this illustration, what God is trying to say is that he never gives up on his people. Even those who sometimes refuse to listen, even those who walk away from God, God never gives up on them and he's going to do anything he can to reach them. And he's the same way with you and I, isn't he? I mean, you know, if God gave up on us the first time we ever messed up, we'd be in big trouble, wouldn't we? But he never gives up on us. He keeps trying to reach us, to touch us. And so here is in Revelation 19, we have this invitation to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The guest list is drawn up. And when the invitations are sent out, the guests refuse to come. And they persistently refuse, it says in the Greek. Not just, no thank you, I can't be there. But they're very vocal about why they refuse and that they refuse. Very opposed. We can liken this whole story also to... Uh, reaching out to, to evangelism and personal ministries as we try and share the gospel with the world. We're going to meet people that refuse to have anything to do with the gospel. They don't want to listen. And there will be some that will be totally opposed to it and violently opposed to it, as we see in this story. And in this story, it's the Israelites who are the special guests. They're supposed to be accepting and expecting the Messiah to come. And they refuse. Think about if you had an invitation to attend a king or the president of the United States family wedding. Even if you didn't believe in their politics, I'd go. Just think of the opportunities to see people you might not see otherwise and, and all the pop, pomp and circumstance that would go with it. I mean, that would be quite an invitation to receive an invitation like that. And you could be saying to yourself, I don't even know this guy. I don't even know his family. Why would I get an invitation? And there are some people that when you present the gospel to them, they say, well, who's this Jesus? What's this Bible all about? I'm not sure. And they may question it. 
Matthew 23 tells us, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as hens gather her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The invitation goes out, and they refuse the invitation. And there were several reasons they could have refused it, but the basic reason they refused the invitation is because they don't accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They won't accept him as their personal savior. They won't accept that he loves them and that he has the power to die and live again that they might have eternal life. And they reject him. And really by refusing an offer of grace, they refuse to share in the banquet that went along with the wedding ceremony. And not only did they refuse, they continued to to refuse. And then the second point in verses 4 to 6, again he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattening are killed and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went in their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. It's hard for us to uh, to, to picture this because we all send out invitations at a wedding and, and we know there are a certain number of people that aren't going to come. And some might not even respond. But certainly none would respond in this violent a manner. When you look at this story. Now for us, fortunately, we know the end from the beginning. And we knew what, or we know what the Jewish uh, leaders were going to do to Jesus. But remember, the Jewish leaders and the people of the day, they don't know that. They don't know how this is going to play out. They don't see it. And of course, we know that wedding feasts in those days went on for days. And the king has everything ready. The calf has been fatted and killed and fattened up and, and ready for the feast and, and everything else that, that would be there. If nothing else, it would be interesting to go to a king or the president or somebody's uh, wedding feast just to see what they'd serve and what it would be like. And some of the best chefs in the world. It would be good. I mean, it would be interesting. And so the king himself extends this invitation. And it's supposed to be a time of celebration. It's supposed to be a happy time. It's supposed to be a time when everybody is laughing and enjoying themselves. And it's a blessing to be there. And, and you just want to wish the couple well as they start their life together. And, uh, and it's, an, it's an invitation that is repeated over and over and over again every time we give the gospel to somebody. This is repeated. This invitation. And it's a great honor when you receive this invitation. Think back to when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And, when you, what, and what it meant to you. But the people turn violent. And they mistreat and even kill some of the messengers. As we think about the gospel going around the world, there are places in this world today where it's very, very dangerous to share the gospel. It could mean your life. It could mean imprisonment. It could mean torture. And Jesus knew that what he was sharing with these Jewish leaders would start the beginning of the end of his life on this earth. And they become very, very violent and harsh. And Jesus warns his enemies of the coming judgment. He tells them, you're going to face the consequences of your actions. And he knew what they would do. But he still offers them an invitation to the wedding banquet. And so as we look at this story, 
It's not always a pretty picture. And when we look at the Bible, the Bible doesn't always paint rosy pictures. Sometimes when we look at the Bible, the stories aren't always the easiest to read and to digest. And sometimes God is very plain about what he wants to say to us. And his message again over and over here is that he doesn't want us to be like those Jewish leaders, like those Pharisees, like those rabbis. He wants us to be open and willing to accept the invitation when he extends it to us. To continue to love, to continue to serve, Continue to stay close to him and enjoy the wedding banquet. The third point that we look at in this story is he goes to the highways and the byways. Verses 8 and onward. He tells his servants the wedding is ready because those that were, were first invited, they aren't worthy. The invitation is taken away from them. They no longer have a right to come. And so he tells them, go into the highways. And everyone that you can find, have them come to the wedding. It's kind of like when we send out brochures for evangelistic meetings. We will mail to everybody in a zip code or everybody in an area. And everybody gets the invitation, come to the meetings. Because we want everybody to know about the love of Jesus, don't we? We want to spread the gospel to the world. And that includes everyone living around us. It includes everyone in our family. It concludes everyone. And this is what's happening. And they go out. And they found both bad and good. And so the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he finds this guy there without a wedding garment on. Now, some people think that the king furnished these wedding garments. That didn't happen at all. What happened is everybody came dressed for a wedding like you would or like you used to. Everybody would come dressed up, the men in their suit and ties and the ladies in their fancy dresses and, 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 and dressed to the nines, looking great. And apparently this guy comes into the wedding like he had just stepped out of the, the milk barn or something. <laughs> he wasn't ready for a wedding. Now, in all fairness, I, I got to talk about my father-in-law. My father-in-law was a farmer and a rancher. And I, I don't know if I, he might have been, was he in a suit at his wedding? I don't remember. At our wedding? Yeah, okay, he was in a suit at our wedding. But otherwise, church every week, he always came in, in overalls or coveralls. You know, the, uh, uh, and, and the thing is, though, he always had a, a, a nice new pair for Sabbath that he only wore for Sabbath. But that was his Sabbath attire. <laughs> And he would come that way. So for him, that, that was an acceptable wedding dress because it was, in the, it was a rural area in Nebraska. And, and a lot of people, that's, you know, that's the way they dressed on the farm. And, and they would always wear their nicest and their best overalls or coveralls. They'd come to church that way. And, and, and that's the way he did. But here in the wedding garment, it was special. They dressed up for a wedding. They looked nice. They had the best clothes they could find for a wedding. It, it, it's kind of like, I don't know if parents still do that with their children, but when our children grew up, they had Sabbath clothes. Clothes that were set aside just for Sabbath, and, and that's when they would wear them. Or a wedding or something like that, a special occasion. And you didn't wear them during the week like that. You kept them nice and clean and, and ready to go. And so this is what's happening. And this guy comes in without anything. And, uh, and so they invite all of these people. And, and it's interesting because when you, it says they, were, they went out to the highways, these were not the religious leaders of the day. These were not the learned, educated uh, people of society. These were the everyday, common, hardworking people of society. And, and nothing against the educated or anything else. But what we're saying is the, 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 the Pharisees and the religious leaders no longer get the invitation because they had rejected it. And sometimes, and, and by today's standards even, I'm a very highly educated person. I have my master's and just my, doc, uh, my dissertation left on my doctorate. But sometimes, the more education you receive, the less likely you are to depend upon God. 
and to turn to God. Because you're so used to figuring it out for yourself out of books and out of what your professors say. And so even if you have a, a, a great deal of education, and many of you do, and, and that's what I appreciate about it. I, I think of uh, 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 Dr. Imler over here, and he's got a great education, but he hasn't let it go to his head. He has realized that even in spite of all that education, he needs Jesus, and he can't be saved without Jesus. But a lot of people don't think that way. They think they're fine, and they don't need anything, and they don't need Jesus. They don't come to the wedding. They turn down the invitation. And so it goes out to the highways and to, to those people that, that feel like they need something in their life and they accept the invitation and they come to the wedding. And so when we look at this story, we look at what's happening here and when we look at this man that doesn't come with a wedding garment on, what he's really saying is, you know, I just want to come for the benefits of this wedding. I just want a good meal to eat. I don't care about the wedding. I don't care about what's going on. I don't care about the king. I don't care about his son. I'm going to do whatever I want. And I'm going to do it my way. We need to be careful as Christians that sometimes we don't get so caught up with the way we live our lives that we forget to live our lives the way God wants us to live them. Because there could be a big difference. We need to stop and think from time to time about our walk with God and where we are in that walk with God. We need to make sure that when we come to Christ, we come with the proper attire on. By that I mean make sure we come with the proper frame of mind, ready to accept Jesus and ready for him to come into our lives. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and I want to look at verses 41 to 46. Here is where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And this always fascinates me because remember, the sheep and the goats have the same characteristics. Verse 41 says, Then you shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and he took me not in. Naked, and he clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and he visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. And so when we look at this story, many are called, but few are chosen. The called is the invitation goes out to everyone. The chosen are those who accept the invitation and those who follow Jesus. Not just in word, but in action. By their lives. By the things that they do. By the things that they say. By the way they live their life. They recognize Christ as their Messiah. As their Savior. And they're willing to to let him lead and guide in their lives. And so really when this story comes right down to it, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to come. First of all, remember that there are gates there. The gates are wide open, but you still need to go through the gates. And so as we look at this story, salvation is not based on ethnicity, it's not based on education. It's not based on income bracket. It's not based on popularity. It's not based on your ministry position in the church. It's not based on your culture. It's not based on your athletic ability. That's the nice thing about it. You don't have to get chosen first. 
Because as long as we're chosen, God has a place for us at the banquet table. And so I think his invitation for all of us is to come, to accept his invitation, to be ready for Jesus when he comes again, to participate in the greatest wedding the world has ever known, the wedding of Jesus and his people as he comes back to take us home. He says, come, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the lessons that you give us in your word to remind us of how much you love us and care for us, to remind us of the fact that you have eternal life waiting for each and every one of us. And Father, I would pray that with everyone here today that they would accept the invitation so that they can be one of the chosen, ready for Jesus when he comes. Bless us, Father, and keep us close to you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your hymnals out, and we're going to turn to our, our closing hymn, number 358, Far and Near, the Fields are Teeming. <laughs>